farmer and co owner of Green Forest Seeds. Keith <clears throat> combines over 20 years of no till farming with 10 years of teaching agriculture and computers, in addition to no tilling, 2,000 acres of irrigated and dry land corn in Nebraska, <clears throat> along with several other crops. He co owns and operates Green Cover Seed, one of the major crop, cover crop seed producers and educators in the United States. Through green cover seed, Keith has experimented with over a hundred different cover crop types and hundreds of mixes planted into various situations and has learned a great deal about cover crop growth, nitrogen fixation, moisture usage, grazing, utilization of cover crops. Uh, Keith was honored by the White House as a 2016 champion of change for sustainable and climate smart agriculture. Keith also developed the Smart Mix Calculator, one of the most widely used cover crop selection tools on the internet. Keith has a master's degree in agricultural ed education from the University of Nebraska and teaches on cover crops and soil health more than 30 times per year to various groups and audiences. And this is what your third stop in Wisconsin? Uh, second. Second. More to go. But he's got more to go, so he'll be in Wisconsin all week. Keith also was appointed by the Nebraska governor to be part of the Nebraska Healthy Soils Task Force and the privilege of serving as the chairman. Today, he's going to present on the top seven things he's learned over his 20 plus years of cover crops and no till farming. So, Keith. All right, great. Thank you very much. Pleasure and an honor to be here. That's the last slide. You want to start first? Well, I guess we could just go right to Q and A. There we go. All right, very good. Well, like I say, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I'll just give you a little bit of background on ourselves here. Uh, my brother and I and our families we farm here in South Central Nebraska, so we're pretty much exactly in the continental United, so the center of the continental United States, right here. So we're obviously going to be a little bit different than your climate up here. Uh, and what I'm going to be sharing about today, I'll show you a lot of things that we've done on our own farm, but I'll talk about how it may look the same or how it may look different here on your operation. So our background is we are uh, been no-tilling for over 30 years. We're about two-thirds of dry land, a third of irrigated uh, corn, beans, cereal. We're in about a 25-inch rainfall area, so significantly less moisture than what you folks up here would get. So when we say dry land, we really mean it. Uh, and the irrigated, the irrigated uh, definitely helps out where we can get it. Typically, a bit of corn, bean, and cereal rotation on a lot of the ground. But since we started down the path of soil health, uh, we're adding things like rye and triticale and oats and barley and sunflowers and buckwheat uh, to our rotation as well. This is what we want our fields to look like. I don't want to see my soil unless I specifically go looking for it. I want it to be covered up at all times. So this, we think this is beautiful. Uh, it, it's, this is wheat stubble. We planted a cover crop into it. The winter terminated the cover crop. And then we came in and just slotted corn right into that. And uh, that's, that's what we want it to look like uh, to really have that good ground cover all year round. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing cover crops for 14 years now. We started green cover seed in 2009 in response to some experiments that we did regarding cover crops and moisture usage. All of this has been built. This is our headquarters now in Nebraska, but everything here that you see has been built since 2011 in response to how fast the whole cover crop thing has grown. So we started out in 2009, we sold enough seed to cover about a thousand acres. And we sold enough seed in 2021 to cover about a million acres. And, and that's not just us growing that fast, that's kind of how fast the soil health, the cover crop movement uh, has gone. Now, one of the cool things that we get to do uh, is we get to work with a lot of really great groups. And so this, uh, the Soil Health Institute came to us a few years ago and they said, hey, we're making this documentary about soil health. We want to make this film and we want you guys to be a part of it. And so if you haven't seen this, I would really encourage you to go to livingsoilfilm.com. It's completely free to watch. Uh, it's been viewed over three and a half million times on YouTube. It's about a 60 minute long film that features us and a number of other people from across the country uh, just talking about living soil and, and how all this stuff works together. 
So we said, yeah, that'd be great. We'd love to be a part of it. So they said, well, what we really want is we want to get a picture of you harvesting corn and planting your cover crops at the same time, because one of the principles of soil health, of course, is to keep a living road at all times. And they said, we really want to demonstrate to people how that works. So we said, sure, we're doing that. Come on out. And so I just wanted to share just a little clip of this here with you. So they sent the film crew out and then, and, you know, I had the hired man go hook up the air seeder and I jumped in the big four-wheel drive tractor and, you know, jumped in, you know, it was a beautiful day in October and was, you know, gearing up and heading down the road thinking, man, this is going to be great. You know, we're going to get lots of publicity, you know, it could be a movie star, who knows what's going to happen with this because it's just, you know, it's a great opportunity. And just about the time that you think, man, things can't get too much better than this, then something like that happens. So I'm sure that as farmers, you guys have all done something stupid like that too. But I'm also pretty sure you probably don't have it captured on high definition drone footage like that. Either. So if you're going to do something stupid, get it well documented so you can, <laughs> you can laugh about it so we uh we are farmers bad things happen to us too and uh, that's just one of them so what i'm going to share today i i, I want to preface it by by this uh, quote from ralph waldo emerson because as you're listening to me talk as you're listening to anybody talk really about these things listen for the principles that we're talking about and not the practices so emerson says as the methods there may be a million and then some but the principles are few the man who can grasp the principles can successfully select his own methods, but the man who tries methods ignoring the principles is sure to have troubles. So in other words, listen to the principles that we're trying to apply, the soil health principles, keeping the soil cover, keeping a living root, maximizing your diversity, minimizing the disturbance, integrating livestock. Listen to those principles and how we're using them, and then you have to figure out on your own farm what the methods or the practices are to employ those same things on your own farm. So here's the top seven things I've learned about cover crops. Number one, this comes as no surprise to anybody that knows me. I learned that I'm not smarter than God. Now, a lot of times we think we are smarter than God, though, because we try to develop systems that we think are going to be better than nature or in a natural system. And so what we've learned is as we are trying to develop cover crop mixes that make the most sense and work the best, what we found to be the most successful is we look at how God created plants and how God created biology to work together in combination. How do these communities and ecosystems work in, in natural native systems? And so there's several observations that we can make, and this is what we try to emulate with our cover crop mixes, with our soil health program, not only on our own farm, but also trying to implement that on other people as well. So the first thing that we see is there's a great diversity of plants, roots, and animals, or specifically biology, in a native natural system. And so that's what we try to do with our cover cropping system as well. That's what we try to do with our farm, but we're not going to be able to get this kind of crazy diversity growing corn and beans and wheat, but we can get crazy kind of diversity growing the cover crop uh, in some of these windows. And so that's what we try to do. We try to help people get diversity back into their soils. We try to get diversity in our own soils. And when we plant seeds like this, we get cover crops that grow like this. And then we start seeing earthworms. We start seeing mycorrhizae fungi. We start seeing these biological components come back to the soils the way that they would have been before we started doing heavy tillage and, and, and intense input agriculture. And so we're starting to return to more of a natural system, even though we're still growing corn and beans and wheat, we're harvesting that for grain production, we're bringing the diversity back through the cover crop portion of that, because we just see so much value in having that diversity uh, through the system. Number two, we see that the soil is always covered. You don't see bare soil in nature. You don't see bare soil and natural native ecosystems. And so I like to show this picture because it's not my farm. And I'm very happy about that. <laughs> I never get invited to speak around home because I have too many pictures of my neighbors and the bad stuff that they do. You know, everybody's got to have that neighbor, right, to be able to compare against. So this guy, this guy is, is like the king of tillage in our county. 
this was the summer fallow the year before, and then he tilled the heck out of it. This picture was taken the first week in June. We were kind of in a dry period already. We were, you know, June 1st, and we were already about five or six inches behind normal in rainfall. And we finally, finally get a one inch rain. And I drive past this field. This is 24 hours after a one inch rain in the middle of a drought. And look at all the water he still has standing. His infiltration here is zero because it should have went in, but because of all the tillage that he's done, it had nowhere to go. And you can see it's pretty flat here. And it's not just on the end rows where he would have packed it down with the green cart and stuff, but all the way through here, uh, it just was standing water. And so such a sad, sad uh, commentary, but it shows uh, because one of the reasons that when it's rained, it came really hard. It came in about 15 minutes. And, and that's what happens anymore is when you get the rain, it's a, it's, a, it's a beater. And so when the raindrops hit this bare, unprotected soil, it blew the soil apart. And those little fine particles of soil that got blown apart with the raindrop just sealed this up and it had no, and the water had nowhere to go. This is my field. These pictures were taken about five minutes apart because these fields are about two minutes apart. Same day, same rain, same everything. But you know how much rain I got? I got all of it. This guy, if somebody asked him how much rain he got, he better not tell people he got an inch of rain because he didn't get an inch of rain into the soil. I got all of it. And so the goal is when somebody asks you how much rain you get, you should be able to say all of it because we want to get it all into the soil and keeping the soil covered is the first step in doing that. Now, there's a lot of other things that has to happen to get it infiltration and water storage and things like that. But we want to keep the soil covered. It's so important. And I'll show you some pictures later on with how keeping the soil covered, what it does for weed control and some other benefits. But we come from a relatively drier environment. And so getting every drop of moisture into the soil is really important for us and for you guys here too, as you go through periods of drought and you can't afford to waste any moisture. So keep that soil covered. Uh, it's one of the things that we see coming from nature. All right, we also see something always alive and always growing. You know, we don't see long fallow periods of nothing growing when the weather conditions are proper for things to grow in nature. So here's a picture. This is some soil uh, in a field I dug up in January or February. There's still snow on the ground here, but I've got a lot of white roots in the soil. Uh, there's actually earthworms up here. They're, they're not super active. This had not frozen yet. It was a relatively mild winter and we had some snow cover. But the point is, is I've still got uh, plants that are alive and growing out there. Cereal rye, some of the cold hardy brassicas. Here we're, again, we're planting right after the combine. We want to get another crop growing as soon as we get this crop out. This is wheat and coming in with another cover crop. And then this picture is just a, a, a corn plant coming up through a decomposing radish carcass. That radish soaked up all the nitrogen from the wheat stubble from the year before. And now as it's releasing this nitrogen, this corn is saying, thank you very much. And it's just taking it right in. And so we want to have something alive and growing all the time because it's a growing green plant that's building our soil. And it's the only way that we're getting carbon into our soil is by the, the photosynthetic activity of this plant, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, turning it into glucose in the plant, and then that plant is pumping a bunch of that uh, carbon back into the soil to, to feed uh, all in biology. So we want to keep something alive and growing as much as possible, as often as we can. We also see that plants are very good at cooperating and not competing when you plant them in a diverse mix like this. The most competitive thing that you can plant, the most competitive thing to a corn plant, is it's not weeds. A lot of people think it's weeds. The most competitive thing to a corn plant is another corn plant and another corn plant and another corn plant and another corn plant because everything has the same canopy height, everything has the same root depth, everything needs the same moisture, the same nutritional requirements. It's the most highly competitive environment that you could ever be in is to put it in a field and crowd it together with a whole bunch of plants exactly like it. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that in our cash cropping systems. We have to do that in order to grow food and grow fiber and all these things. But what I am saying is when we have the opportunity to plant cover crops and we're not gonna be harvesting them, we're not taking them all the way out to grain harvest, then let's not plant 100% of all the same thing because that's a very highly competitive environment. Let's plant a mixture of plants. 
let's have some legumes that are producing nitrogen and let's have some grasses that are better at pulling phosphorus out of the soil and let's mix all these things together and then let the let these plants cooperate with each other and not compete it's a, it's a much better system when we first started green cover we did some experiments with moisture usage of, of cover crops and what we found is anywhere where we planted something in a monoculture, you know, so if vetch by itself, uh, peas by itself, rye or oats by itself, what we saw is that it was a much, uh, it used water a lot more than any place where we put it together in mixes like this. I've got some other pictures here to show this as well later on about how these diverse mixes really use moisture much better. But there's something that goes on when we put these diverse mixes together uh, that these plants are allowed to cooperate and not compete nearly as much. Whoops, there we go. Okay, so that's the first thing. We learned that we're not smarter than God. We look to the natural created systems to see how these things should work together, how they should fit together. Number two is that a living soil is a healthy soil and that often leads to higher yields. Now I say often, it doesn't always lead to higher yields, but we also should not be just focused strictly on yield. We need to be focused on profitability and not just on yield. So you can afford to grow less bushels of something if you can grow those bushels significantly cheaper than somebody who's growing more bushels at a higher price. And so it's really difficult to get farmers out of the mindset of focusing on profitability instead of yield, but that's really where we need to go. However, we've seen plenty of examples of where a living soil that we've, that we've got the biology going, we've got cover crops going, it's unlocking the steel potential with the soil biology and cover crops are one of the best ways to do that. So there's several different experiments that, that if we had more time, I could reference in more detail, but there's experiments with guys putting a couple pounds of radishes in with their winter wheat and the radishes grow in the fall stimulates a biological activity and give the, a, a yield boost in the wheat, even though the radishes die out in the wintertime. Uh, Brendan Rocky is growing a lot of potatoes in, in Colorado. He's seen some significant yield increases and significantly improved uh, profitability uh, by using and integrating cover crops in the system. So, uh, so the SARA survey in corn and beans, uh, they surveyed thousands of farmers and they're showing anywhere from two to three uh, bushel yield increase in soybeans and six to eight yield bushel yield increase in corn over a six to seven year period now. So there's lots of good data out there showing that when you get the biology going in the soil, when you have this living soil, healthy soil, it's going to lead to higher yields, or at least the potential is there. And again, it does not always mean that cover crops will correlate to higher yields. I'll be honest with you, we've had times where we planted cover crops on our farm and we've had lower yields because of the way the rains came. Cover crops will use some moisture to get established. They will gain you that moisture back later on as you have better infiltration and less evaporation. But if you don't get the rains at the right times to help it recover, it may hurt you in the short term. So that, that, that does happen. But just like any practice in farming, you know, nothing is gonna work 100% of the time. And so, you know, we, we, we play the averages and we plant the crops that we think are going to work the best. So we see typically higher yields when we integrate these cover crops properly into the system uh, because of the biology that's driving the system. And number three, if we're going to get the biology, we've learned that if you grow it, they will come. Now, a lot of people ask, do I need to be putting in all these biological amendments and all these you know, bugs in a jug? And I'm not necessarily opposed to that. We use some of that on our own operation. But the point is, is that you've got biology in your soil already. If you create the right environment for these organisms, uh, and this is an earthworm as an example here. I showed you some mycorrhizal fungi earlier. If you provide the right environment, you will get significantly increased populations of your earthworms and other things. You know, as a kid growing up, if we wanted to go fishing, we had to go dig our own worms. You know, dad wasn't going to go buy fishing worms. So we had to go dig our own worms if we wanted to go fishing. And there was one place on our whole farm where we could go dig for worms. And that was where the sewer ran out of the house. It was just a straight pipe. You know, back in the 70s, nobody had septic tanks. And, we noticed. and so the sewer just dumped out and ran down the hill. And, and that stayed moist. And it was never tilled. And that's where the worms were. And that's where we thought worms were. I did not know 
that worms could actually be out in a crop production field. Because at that time, we were pretty heavy tillage. And we just never saw worms out there. Now, since we switched to no-till, especially since we've been doing cover crops, this is this is from our this is what our soil looks like. This is from our farm right here. I can go out just about anywhere, anytime where there's moisture in the soil, and I can dig up, especially if I'm digging up or right around the roots of a plant, uh, we're going to find earthworms in just every spade full of soil. So we've increased it that much because we've changed the environment that we're having. We think of our soil now more as an ecosystem or a habitat for this biological life. Earthworms are easy because we can see them, but there's billions and billions of other organisms in here as well that we can't see, but are equally as important. All the bacteria and the fungi and the, and the beneficial nematodes. Just, you know, lots and lots of different things going on here. Too, so often it's so easy to ignore the biology because we can't see it. But that doesn't mean it's not there and it doesn't mean it's not important. So we really try to focus on, on providing the environment for our biology to grow. Uh, and then they'll come and they'll, they'll, you know, the population will seriously increase. So this is a picture of a, you know, the whole food web here, the prairie food web. And really what we're interested in doing is having plants growing, having roots putting carbon into the soil, which are feeding the biology. And, and the, the point that I'm making with this slide is that the biological life of the system is part of the food web. We can see all this up here. This is easier for us to understand. But really, a lot of the work is being done down here with the bacteria and the fungi and the earthworms. And so we need to focus as much underground as we focus above the ground. And sometimes that's harder to do. I love this article from Scientific America. Uh, it says mycorrhizae fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. And I love that because you, oftentimes when you think about a mining operation, you think about this huge, gigantic equipment, you know, big payloaders and big trucks. But they're saying the, the largest mining operation in the world is happening at a microscopic level. This picture right here, this is a piece of feldspar. Just think of it as a tiny little grain of sand, highly magnified. And these little channels right here, these are actual channels that have been cut into this. Think of those as little microscopic mine shafts. But the mycorrhizae fungi, the hyphae, they secrete the right chemicals that it can actually dissolve that solid rock. It liquefies liquid or solid mineral, it liquefies it, and then it brings it back to the host plant. And so this is how plants are pulling the nutrients out of the soil. Plants can't do it by themselves. They have to rely on the, the biology, in this case, fungus, to do that. But the only way the fungus can afford to do that is if the plant is willing to feed them with the carbon that the plant is producing uh, through photosynthesis. Here's a picture of what it looks like. This is a plant root. These are the arbuscles, these little black dots here. These are actually growing inside the plant root. And then these hyphae come out through the plant root. And this is what's going out into the soil and exploring and bringing back those nutrients. Most of our soils, in fact, I think I have the quote here from the author. I guess I don't on this one. Most of our soils are loaded with nutrients. And we've got enough phosphorus in our soils to grow crops for thousands of years, just not available to the plants. God never designed plants to be able to pull nutrients directly out of the soil. He designed the bacteria, the fungi, to pull the nutrients out and work in conjunction with the plants. So it all works together as a system. And when you have the biology working, uh, then it really works a lot better. Here's another picture of what this looks like. Uh, this is a plant root. This is the mycorrhiza, fungi, the arbuscles. And then you can see the, uh, the hyphae stringing out here. And, and, and this is highly magnified. You're not going to see this with your naked eyes. So you can't go out and just dig up your soil and go, oh, look at all that mycorrhiza that I have. You'll see other types of funguses and other types of uh, webbing and stuff. But if you're seeing it, it's, it's probably more of a saprophytic fungi, which is a decomposer. Uh, you're not going to be able to see this with the naked eye. It's just too small. It's too fine. Uh, yeah, here's a, here's a quote by the author, Jennifer Fraser. She says, oddly enough, many of our soils are rich in important nutrients, but they're locked up in a physical form, which makes them unavailable to most plants. And so in order to unlock the nutrients that we have in our soils, we have to go beyond just using plants. Uh, we have to get the biology involved again. So when we farm in such a way, and, and, and it's reducing tillage or eliminating tillage, because that's one of the worst things for both earthworms and mycorrhiza, 
is tillage. When we can get rid of the tillage, then we start reducing the levels of synthetic inputs because when we give the plant everything it needs from a jug or from a sprayer, the plant has no incentive to give the resources to build the biological levels of the soil. And so we need to eliminate the tillage and then we need to not necessarily eliminate, but reduce the amount of inputs that we're giving our system. Then we can get the biology back involved and we can get them liberating these nutrients. We can get them making nitrogen out of atmospheric nitrogen. There's 30,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre of crop ground in the United States. Think of that number, 30,000 tons. But yet we spend billions of dollars putting nitrogen out of crops because our plants can't do anything with the nitrogen in the atmosphere. That again, that has to go through the biology, that has to go through bacteria, it has to go through some sort of organism in order to make it available to the plants. Uh, the importance of soil bio biological life to the health of the soil can't be overstated. It's just so important. You know, in our own farming operation, we don't have all of the answers. We're still looking for the answers. But I think we're at least asking the right questions now. We never used to ask this question. But the question that we ask now when we make a decision about, are we going to do this input? Are we going to do this crop rotation? Are we going to spray this on? We're at least asking the question now, how is that going to affect the soil biology? It's become that important to us that we're at least now asking that question. And we're still trying to find the answers. We don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that we wish we knew more about, particularly about biology and you know, do we need to add this bug or that bug or you know, what's it gonna do if we spray this or add that. And, and so we're still learning, lots of people are still learning, even the top scientists in the world will tell you that they're still trying to figure out how a lot of this works. Uh, you should have gotten a copy of our soil health resource guide when you came in. If you didn't get one, try grab one at the table downstairs, has a picture of the sunflower. On the front, we've got lots of articles in there from some of these top scientists around the world talking about some of these biological systems, talking about how these systems work together, how plants communicate with the microbes, how plants communicate with the biology. We're, we're leveraging our relationships with these really smart people because you know you can't be smart, at least no smart people, that's been our theory. And so we've got a lot of their intelligence and wisdom and experience in that guide that, that you can read about. Number four, you need to mix it up. Fourth thing that we learned is really important to have these mixtures, especially when it comes to cover crops. Again, I talked earlier about how we kind of got started with the moisture sensor study and how we saw from the very beginning the power of that diverse mix. So I'm going to show you a few more pictures and talk in more detail about diversity here because it's really, really important to us as a company because we've seen what it does on our own ground and we want to confer those benefits to others as well. So we think of cover crops as kind of the Swiss Army knife in the agricultural world. Of course, the Swiss Army knife has all these different tools, and you can use this to do a lot of different things. And so what we see with cover crops is we can do, you know, we can improve soil health and increase yield and build organic matter. And all the way around this, we've got all these different benefits that we can get from cover crops, but we have to use the right ones at the right time. Uh, there's, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. You can't just throw cover crops out there and expect them to work. It has to be integrated into the system that you have. And you're probably going to have to change some other parts of your system to make it really work right, to make it work profitably. And so we can accomplish a lot of different benefits. And if you call us up and say, hey, I want to do a cover crop, first question we're going to ask, or the first question any seed company should ask you is, what do you want to try to accomplish? You know, do you want to provide nitrogen through legumes? Are you trying to build soil organic matter? Are you trying to scavenge nitrogen? Because each one of these, if you say, well, these are the top two things I want to do, it's going to require a different combination of cover crops to give you the best chance to do that. So, uh, you know, there's lots of different things you can do with cover crops. And when we put it in a mix, when we put it in a diverse mix, now we can start to accomplish multiple things with the same cover crop planting. There's great power and diversity. Our natural systems have huge amounts of diversity, as you see in the native system. Our, our cropping systems do not. You know, we've got, you know, millions and millions of acres of monoculture corn and monoculture soybeans and alfalfa and wheat. And again, I'm not saying we should get away from this because we have to do this to earn a living, to make money. But when we have the opportunity to plant a cover crop, we should go for as much diversity as possible. 
I'm, I'm sure quite a few of you have probably heard Dr. Dwayne Beck speak. He's from uh, South Dakota. But he, he says weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system which lacks diversity. And so what he's found in a lot of his research is that when we grow too many monoculture crops without having a diverse enough rotation, nature is adding in this diversity in the way of weeds and diseases. But we can counteract that effort uh, with the weeds and diseases by adding beneficial diversity to our system. And so again, he has done a lot of research, a lot of, uh, of studies and, and practical application in South Dakota there about how a four crop rotation like this has far less weed pressure than a, just a two crop rotation like corn and soybeans. And so the more we can diversify, the more diversity we get into our system, the less weed pressure, the less disease pressure we can get, uh, both from a crop rotation standpoint as well as from a diversity standpoint. And again, we're not necessarily here to tell you that you should be growing eight different cash crops. Maybe some of you already are, maybe some of you could, uh, but, but when you get the opportunity to get a cover crop in and, and you know, add as much diversity as possible. Now, it's not always gonna be possible to have an eight plant cover crop mix in Wisconsin if you're planting in October. There's probably two things that really work. And so still planting cereal rye by itself is better than planting nothing. But if you have the opportunity with a crop rotation or, or, or whatever to get it in earlier, and you can start adding other things to the mix, that's where we can start adding this diversity. So it's, it's difficult to get diversity in your cash crop rotation. The cover crops are the perfect opportunity to get that diversity. See, if you're gonna grow additional cash crops, you have to have three things typically. Sometimes you have to have specialized equipment, you need specialized knowledge, and then of course you need specialized markets if you're gonna grow something that you can't just default to the elevator itself. And, and you can develop these, and the people that can develop these and grow additional cash crops are, are very profitable. But if you don't want to do that, the cover crops, you don't need specialized equipment, you don't need specialized knowledge, and you don't need specialized markets. So that's where it's just the easiest way to get that diversity in your system. So I want to just show you one example of how we've implemented this on our own farm. Uh, this is double crop sunflowers with cover companions. Now you're not going to have time up here to double crop sunflowers after you harvest wheat. So you could do this type of system, what we're showing you here, but you would have to do it as a full season sunflower crop, not as a double crop. But uh, you could you could do this uh, by grazing out some rye. And I think as long as you got sunflowers planted up here, you know, probably by the middle of June, you could make a sunflower crop. So you could you could graze out some rye or something. Anyway, again, look at the, the principles here, not the practices. So what we were doing here, we we're harvesting wheat and then we're coming in and we're planting a sunflower uh, cover, uh, sunflower cash crop with cover crop companions. So we're planting hybrid sunflowers. And then also we're planting mung beans, chickpeas, batch, lentils, crimson clover, peas, mustard, cabbage, buckwheat, flax. And we're mixing that all together. And it looks like this. So we're just mixing, these are the hybrid sunflower seeds and then all the other companions, mixing it all together, putting it in a grain drill and just planting it. Now we have also done it where we planted all the companion mix of the drill and then we come back and we plant the sunflowers with a corn planter in 30 inch rows. That probably works better for the sunflowers, but it is a second pass through the field. So it's kind of up to, to you how you'd want to do that. Here's what it looks like when it's coming up. This is when they were all drilled together, obviously no rows, but I've got lots of sunflowers growing here. But look at this buckwheat. My buckwheat is up and going. Buckwheat will flower in 30 days. So I've got all this flowering out here. I'm attracting huge amounts of beneficial insects, which is gonna be important because down in our area, if you grow sunflowers, you often have to spray for sunflower head moth because that's a, that's a pest. Uh, but when we've done it in this system like this, where we have all this buckwheat blooming and bringing in lots of predatory insects, we rarely have troubles with head moth and we rarely have to spray. So we've got all this stuff growing and it's hard to see, but down in here there's mung beans and there's cow peas and there's other legumes growing as well. I think we've got a picture here. Yeah, so here's a picture of a legume. Uh, this is a pea or a cow pea. 
Uh, so I've got nodulation going on in the legume. Sunflowers obviously don't nodulate. They can't produce nitrogen through rhizobia bacteria. So I've got other things in the system that can do this. So these plants are bringing nitrogen into the system. I've also got huge amounts of insect diversity here. We've got lots of pollinators, lots of beneficial insects uh, that are uh, taking care of my insect problems. Uh, it's a beautiful field. We have, we have people all the time want to come out and take pictures in, in fields like this. And here's what it looks like at harvest time. Okay, so the sunflowers have dried up. They're ready to be harvested, but I've got all this stuff growing down here yet, still working for me, still building soil health, still conferring lots of benefits. Uh, if I'm a grazer, I could turn cattle out here after I harvest these sunflowers. Uh, if I'm a food plotter, there's a tremendous amount of, of deer forage here. So just lots of benefits of being able to get my cash crop harvested while still having lots of the soil health benefits as well. Will that work up here? It could, it may not be your best solution, uh, but again, the, the thinking is, you know, think of ways that you can get your cash crop and get cover crops working at the same time. Uh, here's some other pictures. This is from Gabe Brown's place up at Bismarck, North Dakota. Again, this is talking about the power of diversity. I talked about this a little bit earlier on when I was sharing about the experiments that we did when we saw the monocultures using more moisture than the mixes did. And this is exactly what they saw in 2006. They planted cover crops, they planted monoculture strips. Look how dry it was in 2006. This picture was taken at the end of July. These cover crops were planted at the end of May. So 60 days. They had less than one inch of rain in that 60 day period. Less than three inches of rain for the whole year to the end of July. So very, very dry. This is what turnips look like. They grew up and they just fried back down because they didn't have any moisture to keep going. This is what radishes look like, very similar. They had enough moisture to get going, but then they just kind of died back due to drought. And then this is what the mix looked like. You can kind of see this little brown strip back here. That's those earlier pictures I just had. That's their monoculture strips. They planted the rest of the field to a very diverse mix that had all these different things in it. Now that's not the greatest growth in the world, but that looks pretty darn good for three inches of rain for the entire year. And, and so there's something going on when we mix these species together. Like I talked about earlier, there's just a synergistic effect and plants are gonna cooperate more than they compete. And you're gonna get a lot more growth and a lot more benefits from these mixes. Number five, cover-ups and competition are good things. So this is all gonna be about weed control here. Again, residue covering the ground makes the whole system work. And we looked at these pictures already and how that covering can really make an effect on uh, your water infiltration. Uh, Rolf Dirsch, who's kind of the godfather of the soil health movement in South America, uh, he says almost all advantages of the no-till system come from the permanent cover of the soil and only a few come from not tilling the soil. So in other words, what he's saying is it's more important to keep the soil covered than it is to not till. But one of the biggest problems with tillage is we lose all of our residue and now our soil is bare. And so we always want to keep that ground fully covered with whenever possible. Again, I showed you this picture, but I, I just love this because this is what we want it to look like. I don't want to be able to see where my planter went. So obviously we're not using any row cleaners. We're not doing any strip till. But we used to use row cleaners, uh, but once our soils got in good condition and the structure really came, uh, we determined that we no longer needed them, and so we were able to weed ourselves off. So the only thing that goes through our soil now is just double disc openers and then our closing wheels. And so that's that's we really like this because there's there's very little bare exposed soil uh, that can be washed away or blown away. So here's some experiments, some studies that we did uh, on weed control and the amount of residue that we can get here. So this is irrigated corn. This picture was taken uh, May 11th. So we had planted cereal rye cover crop the previous October after soybean harvest. And what we did is the majority of the field, you can see the most of the field here, we sprayed out three weeks or we sprayed out 10 days before we planted the corn. So probably about the middle of April, we sprayed this out. We planted the corn then towards the end of April. And you can just see it kind of starting to come through here in the middle of May. We left one strip here. There's a 90 foot strip right down the middle where we did not spray it out at the same time. We actually sprayed this out three weeks after we planted the corn. And, you, and then we just watched 
what the difference in residue was, watched what the difference in the corn production was. Here's what it looked like when we sprayed it out 10 days before. Pretty good residue. Uh, you know, the corn's coming up through there just fine. Uh, and, and good residue cover. We This was 2012. Very, very dry, very, very windy. We had some really massive dust storms uh, during this time period. I've got some good video of showing, you know, there's not one piece of soil moving out of these fields because I had such good ground cover. And even though the tops of this, this cereal rye was just blowing like crazy, this corn was hardly moving at all because it was stuck down in there and sheltered. This is what it looks like where the rye was sprayed out three weeks after we planted corn. Obviously, it's still kind of green. It's still in the process of dying. Uh, but you know, again, we still got a good stand in here. Now, if we would have rolled this down after we sprayed it out, I think we would have had better luck because this is a little spindly. It, it, it suffered a little bit from lack of sunlight getting down to these plants. And here's, here's the line. This, is, this picture was taken a couple of weeks later in June. But you can already start to see the difference in how much residue I have here, where it was three weeks afterwards versus 10 days before. Now, I'm not saying that you should always spray your rye out three weeks afterwards. There's a lot of risk and inherent dangers in doing this. We just wanted to see what we could do and see how much residue we could build. But here's what's cool. This is what it looks like in that same field three weeks after we planted, or when we sprayed it out three weeks after planting, and this was the middle of August. I've still got tremendous residue and no weed pressure at all where I've got all this cover. So if we can figure out how to do this consistently and get our crop to come up through that heavy mass of, of cover crop, we get excellent weed control throughout the entire season. And uh, that's, you know, so again, we're still learning, we're still working on trying that. But here's what it looks like when I didn't have a cover crop. This is that strip that was sprayed out late. And so you can see it's headed out in this green, there's corn coming up in a row right here, but all of this mare's tail, anywhere where I didn't have cereal rye, drove wide, or the air seeder didn't get turned on here, there's mare's tail popping up everywhere. There's not a single mare's tail anywhere back in here. Mare's tail used to be one of our biggest weed issues, but once we started using cover crop rye, mare's tail just goes away. Mare's tail is a very poor competitor. It's just that this time of year, you know, in April, there's nothing else growing out here, so mare's tail is just going to grow. But if there's cereal rye growing, and you don't, you know, there's even a 40 to 50 pound range of cereal rye will control 99% of your mare's tail issues where you have a good stand of rye. So we no longer worry about mare's tail. We've got other weed issues, palmer amaranth and water hemp, and some things like that that we still struggle with because they germinate later in the season when I don't have that big mass down because I'm not, you know, I'm not able to do this all the time, or at least we're too chicken to do this every year on, on all the fields because of moisture issues and, and germination issues and other things. But I think if I could do this on a consistent basis, we'd have much fewer weed problems. Uh, cereal rye contains some chemical compounds of benzoxidine uh, that, that chemically inhibits small seed germination. So a lot of weed seeds are very small. So it can inhibit that. And then weed seeds also need nitrogen in order to grow. And cereal rye is great at taking up the nitrogen and it's great at holding on to it and releasing it fairly slowly. And, and that again will help with weeds not wanting to germinate. This is another picture here. You can see the cover crop that had been planted the previous fall on a line right here. And then the farmer came in, this is one of our customers, not ours. He planted soybeans in 30 inch rows and a little bit of a diagonal. But look at the amount of weed pressure he's got anywhere where he did not have a cover crop and the lack of weeds anywhere where he did. This is cereal rye that he let grow out fairly long, sprayed it out, and he's got just really great weed control everywhere where he had the rye. Another picture, and this is some fallow ground out in West Kansas. Uh, this is actually spring planted oats here and no boats planted here. Uh, he needs to get out here and spray this or these weeds are gonna make seed. But where he had the cover crop growing, he's terminated the cover crop now, so the oats didn't make seed. He's got excellent weed control in that, um, as opposed to this. Again, back to our farm. Uh, this is some cereal rye that we planted uh, in the uh, September 20th, 2015. We graze this with a heavy rate. This is just trampled down with livestock here. So we intensely grazed it in the early spring and then we drilled soybeans in here May 20th. 
And that's what it looked like as a close-up. Really good ground cover. The cattle did a good job of trampling it, stomping it down to the ground. Uh, we have another part of the field that we did not graze. This is what it looked like. This is how tall the rye was. We drilled right through it. This is where the duels of the tractor ran. So you can see how it got smashed down here. We did come back and we rolled it down after we drilled it, after we planted it. Looked like that. Then the soybeans come right up through it. Now, this is what gets me excited because this rye was planted back in September. We put the soybeans in in May. And this picture is from the middle of August. If I can continue to have good ground cover, good residue cover like that in the middle of August, I have very few weed issues because I'm preventing that sunlight from getting the wheat seeds. Wheat seeds aren't going to germinate if they don't see sunlight. So if you can keep them covered, you can keep them buried, then you just don't have those issues with, uh, with wheat seed germination. So that was really good. Soybeans look great, really clean. We, uh, you know, we did not post this. Uh, we, we did spray the rye to finish off the killing because at the time we didn't have a very good roller. And so we sprayed it right when we rolled that down and then we did not post it afterwards. And just so you think that we're such great farmers and we don't have any weed pressure, this is the exact same field I just turned around and took a picture of the Andros. Here's the road right here. So this is where all the traffic, the combine grain cart traffic. We had a poor stand of rye here because of compaction issues and other things, uh, all the turning on the fields. And so we just had a poor stand of rye. And anywhere where the rye was not very thick, we have plenty of pigweed, water hemp, amaranth coming. And so that's you know the difference between this in the main part of the field and this on the end rows is pretty significant. And it all comes back to how much residue can I get out there? How much cover can I get on the soil to just bury those weed seeds? And then number six thing that we've learned is that cattle love the salad barn. I don't know how many cattle you guys run around here, but down where we're at, there's a lot of people that have cattle and these cover crops can be tremendous resources for additional supplemental forage. Uh, whether it be running beef cows, I think that there's could be some great things with running dairy replacement heifers out in these in these paddocks, but there's tremendous grazing potential to come. And properly managed livestock are a great way to extend the benefits of cover crops. Now, I say properly managed because if they're improperly managed, you're going to wish that you didn't have livestock out there because if you overgraze, you graze at the wrong time when it's too wet, things like that then you're going to actually send your soil health backwards rather than increasing it. So you gotta be careful about doing that, uh, but they're a great tool when they're properly managed. So a number of years ago, I did a, a presentation where I just did a bunch of case studies of grazing annual forage cover crops. And this is from all over the country, everywhere from Florida all the way up through Nebraska and Colorado and Kansas. And what just really struck me is that everybody's doing it a little bit differently. Everybody has different techniques and ways to manage their cattle, and ways to manage the forage. And it, it kind of reminded me of this quote, that grazing is an art and using the same tools and supplies but getting different results because of the creativity and the intuition of the artist. So my warning to you would be, don't integrate livestock heavily into your system unless you've got somebody who's that has a passion for doing that for managing it and so it's really important because the the results that you're going to get are going to be a direct uh proportion to the amount of uh effort that gets put into it so the number seven was to remember to focus on your most important crop sometimes i i put this in this talk to remind myself about this as much as anybody else because sometimes it's so easy to get so focused and tied up on our farming operation, on our job, and, and, and making it a living, that we forget how to actually live. So this is a picture of my wife and I and our family, uh, a little vacation that we took down to the Gulf Shores of Alabama a couple of years ago. And so I put that in to remind myself, as well as to encourage you to really focus on what your most important crop is, and that's growing your family, growing your friends, growing the relationships uh, that you're in. So I want to close in the last couple of minutes that I have here. I have this little story that I just call a tale of two fields. And I really like this because this, this, this is us and our neighbor. Again, showing this is a different neighbor. This is a different math farm neighbor. But it, it, it's just so telling because it really tells the difference between two systems and two mindsets. So this is my neighbor harvesting irrigated corn, you know, 240 bushel irrigated corn. 
He should have all kinds of residue out here. He should be able to build his carbon levels of the soil tremendously from all this residue out here. Now he'll plant soybeans into this. These soybeans should have all kinds of carbon to work with and grow with and all kinds of ground cover. We are right across the fence line. We're harvesting soybeans. Obviously, soybeans don't leave near as much residue behind. If anybody should have bare soils come next spring, it would likely be us as the soybean residue disappears very quickly. Higher in nitrogen is going to break down pretty quickly. So after harvest, here comes my neighbor. He he, he he takes a flail shredder through, he chops these corn stalks, breaks them into windrows, bales it up, and hauls this off to the feedlot. He probably gets $35 or $40 a bale. He's probably thinking he's making a lot of money. He doesn't know that there's probably $50 in nutrients in that bale, let alone all the other bad things that are soon to happen to him. So here, same time, we're out uh, as soon as we get the beans harvested. We're following it with planting the diverse cover crop mix, and this would have been probably towards the tail end of September. Fast forward to the spring, here's my neighbor's field. Where did all that 240 bushels of corn stalks go? Well, it went to the feedlot. What's he got left? He's got you know stumps and root balls left. Everything else is blown away. And we've gotten some hard rains. And just look at how crusted this soil is. He's got beans planted here. They're trying to come up, but they're they're definitely stunted. They're crusted in. He's just got a mess here. This is not a good environment for a plant to be growing in because he's removed all the residue. But this guy can say, guess what? I'm no-till. He's never did any tillage. He did a lot of other bad things. He didn't do tillage. So the point is, is that no-till is not the answer. No-till by itself is not the answer. Again, right across the fence line, here's what ours looks like. I, this is my cover crop mix. I planted winter barley, crimson clover, hairy vetch, winter peas. Uh, there's some cereal rye down in here, just a real diverse mix. We have planted this. This is where the row unit of the corn, uh, the corn planter went. So there's actually corn planted. This is right before uh, we would have came in and sprayed this out and crimped it down. We had a tremendous amount of beneficial insect life. Uh, lots of ladybugs, lady beetles out there because I had life all the way up to where I got the next crop established. And so this is what we want to see. And there's there's kind of the fence line comparison of you know the bare the bare ground here where he took it all off. He actually had you know on the fence line cut all of his leaves that blew over here. And then here's our field here with the, the cover crop uh, that has been corn's been planted into here, beans have been planted into here. And the question is, you know, which which situation would you rather be, which field would you rather be? Which of those fields is being protected? Which of those fields is being fed? Which of those is being regenerated for future generations? And of course, the answer is obvious. It's the one where we have life. It's where we have things growing. It's where we're doing things uh, the way that nature intended it to grow. So uh, I appreciate your time. I will have some time for questions here. If you have additional follow-up questions, here's my email address. Feel free to shoot me an email. I've also got the soil health resource guides. You've got this one. We've got other editions from previous years. You can go to our website and download those for free. If you'd like to pull those off our website and read them and learn from them and share them, that's, that would be great also. So uh, what questions do we introduce that I'm going to how much of that residue into my next crop keeps going down and down? Because the higher the carbon, the slower it breaks down. So like the pictures I showed you where I planted that corn into that cereal rye, you know, that was probably 45 to 51. I was not counting on any nitrogen release out of that. We had we still put our full amount of fertility on with that. The last pictures that I showed that had the vetch and the clover and the peas and all that, you know, that was probably 25 to one. And, and there was probably 120, 140 pounds of nitrogen in that. You know, I would give 60 to 70 pounds of nitrogen credit for that cover crop for that next crop of corn. So it not only matters how much biomass you have, what the nitrogen content is, but also the carbon amount as well. So those are kind of some rules of thumb that we go with. Now, if it was a cover crop that was planted, you know, the, the summer before, like after wheat harvest and then a winter kill, then it has longer time to lay there. The longer it has, the more you're going to get pulled out. of it. And the part that you don't get pulled out to use for that corn crop, it's not lost. It's going to carry over for your next crop as well. As any fertilizer. The fertilizer. 
Um, what we do when we're fertilizing, especially if you're going to grow cereal rye as a cover crop, don't you can't get your nitrogen out there early, or that cereal rye is just going to take it up and hold it. We put some on with a planter. Uh, we will top dress some uh, as it's growing vegetatively, and then on all of our irrigated ground, we will fertigate. We'll run it through the pivots on the majority of what we're doing because then we can spoon feed it as it needs it. Um, but on our dry land, we're putting about half on with the planter, and the other half on. You know, streaming it on at like V6 to V8, somewhere in there. But almost no nitrogen goes on before the crop's planted because I don't want the cover crop to take that up. I need it the cover crop to take up what's in the soil and do its work, and then we fertilize later. Good question. What else? Yeah. So the question is, in a grazing situation, what percentage of annuals with what percentage of perennials? Well, it really depends. You're going to really struggle to get annuals to, to establish in a good established perennial system. What we found is that if you have predominantly warm season perennials, you can sometimes get cool season annuals planted when your perennials have gone dormant. Or if you have cool season annuals, when they go dormant in the summertime, or cool season perennials, sorry, when those go dormant through the summertime, you might be able to get some warm season annuals. You're not going to be able to get warm season annuals and warm season perennials to exist at the same time. The perennials are just going to choke them out. You won't get establishment. So you have to find the periods of dormancy for your perennials. And then, and then you plant a fairly full rate of annuals because you're going to have a limited time for them to grow. Is really just kind of during the dormancy period of your perennial. So you plant a, a relatively high rate of those, knowing that it's going to grow for a short period of time. And if you don't catch a, catch a rain to get it going, you may not get anything. You're not going to hurt your perennials doing it. You may not get much out of your annual planting if you don't catch the right rains. But but other than that, I, I would not I would not try to plant my perennials at a thin rate, thinking that you're going to interseed annuals later. Uh, I've just not seen that work very well. So do a full rate of perennials and then try to sneak in on the corners where those things are dormant to get your annuals established. Yeah. If you put in cover crops for a month after you plant corn, so when they were in the year. Yeah, so the question is about interseeding cover crops into growing corn. Uh, we had this conversation a little bit earlier this morning. Very popular topic. A lot of people are interested in this. A lot of people trying different things. What we've seen work the best is number one, you got to get it in at the right time, and that's V3 to V4. If you wait till your corn is V5, 6, 7, or too late, that corn is going to canopy and it's going to shade everything out. You've got to get sunlight to your cover crop early enough to get some of the root establishment before it goes under the canopy. So that's the first thing is you got to get the timing right. Number two, you need to get the seed in the ground. You're not going to have consistent success if you're broadcasting that seed. You need to figure out a way to get it in the ground that's going to give it the best chance to establish. Again, because timing is so crucial, you can't afford for it to lay there two weeks until you get a rain to bring it up. You got to get some sort of a disc opener to get it in the ground. And then number three, you know, your chemical program is going to really affect what you can do. You're not going to be able to use, you know, really strong, long residuals and still get these cover crops to grow. So the, the people, you know, people have been using, you know, different uh, uh, different chemistries and there's, you can get online. Penn State's done a lot of research on this. And they've got some really good research. Verdict, I think, is one of the herbicides that they used uh, successfully with this. Uh, and then you got to pick the right things to use. And typically, what most people are having the most success with are cool season annuals. They can get some early growth and establish, and then as the heat comes on in the summer and the canopy closes and you get shade, those plants kind of go into a semi-dormant state. And so then they don't need a lot of sunlight to stay alive. So things like annual ryegrass, hairy vetch, crimson clover, red clover, some of your brassicas, those tend to have the best success because they're cool season, Heat sends them into a kind of a semi-dormant state, and they're not trying to grow aggressively through the summer. Now, they're still not always going to stay alive. 
but they're going to have the best chance of staying alive for you. The other approach that you can take is to plant a really aggressive warm season plant like a cowpea, something that's going to climb and bind up your plants. And, and they'll keep some leaves up at the top of the canopy to keep photosynthesis going. So I would encourage you to try it, to try it on small scales until you kind of see what works for you in your area. The other thing that a lot of people have started experimenting with are wider row corn. You know, there's been quite a bit of research done on going to, you know, 60 inch corn, you know, skipping every other row, doubling your population in the one row. So you're not, you're not decreasing the amount of plants per acre. You're just decreasing the number of rows. It started out with a group of people from Iowa, practical farmers of Iowa guys, wanting to do this to see if they could increase their yield by getting more sunlight to each plant because of that edge row effect. And what they found is there's some validity to that. What they also found is you get tremendous amount of forage growth in a 60 inch row that you never get in a 30 inch row. So again, I don't know that I would do that unless I had a, a fairly large cattle operation and there was a lot of value to me in growing that additional forage without taking a big yield penalty on, on the corn. Uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa has a lot of good research on their website about guys doing this. A lot of them are only seeing like a 5% yield decrease by going to a 60 and throw as long as you're not decreasing your population of corn doing it. Yes? When I mentioned about your, you don't run the uh, rope leaders, get air pinning and stuff termination. Yeah, so the question is, because we don't run row cleaners, are we getting hair peening? Are we, you know, having reduced germination due to that? Uh, we haven't seen that as being a big issue. And again, we didn't take our row cleaners off right away. Because if your soil doesn't have very good structure, you will see a lot more hair pinning, no doubt about it. And then it becomes more important to kind of clean that off and have a clean strip to plant into. As you build your soil structure, as your aggregates become more and more stable, as the biology is in your system and they glue all that together, your soil becomes just, it's, it's much firmer. It's not compacted, but it's firm, it's, it's got structure. And so now you can, you can run over it and you, when those double disc openers hit that straw and that residue, you get a clean cut instead of a push. And so what we found is that as our soil conditions improved at that point, we were able to take those row cleaners off and then just go in with the double disc openers. Now, with that being said, it's really important that you keep your double disc openers really, really sharp and keep them new. We replace ours every year, whether we think we need them or not, because it's a relatively small investment for what we're doing. Uh, and, and we don't buy the OEM, you know, we buy an upgraded, you know, heavier blade, you know, better steel. Uh, we spend a lot of money on those double disc openers, but that's, that's the only thing hitting that soil. Now we have last year, we did, and I don't, they didn't have pictures of it in here. We did put the Dawn ZRX cover crop rollers on the front of our planter. So on our corn planter now, we've got a set of rollers up front. So what it's doing is we're planting into that taller rye now, it's rolling it down ahead of planting. And so we're doing a rolling operation and a planting operation with the same machine. It's not moving any residue. You, you, can, you can do it to where you can, because it's got, it's got some double discs out front. We run those up to where we're doing no soil disturbance, but it's leaning the residue both directions. And then the roller stomps it down. And so now when I'm planting, I'm, I'm still planting into an undisturbed strip, but all of the biomass is leaning either way. And so I've got a less residue to have my double disc openers to have to go through. Just a little bit. Our, we're blessed with pretty good soils. We're mostly really good silt loams. Uh, we've got some exposed hillsides, you know, that have had erosion over the years that's much higher clay content. And, and, you know, they're certainly more challenging to, to farm those clay hillsides. But for the most part, we've got pretty good silt loam soils. So we are blessed with that. Now we work with, you know, our customers have soils from, you know, everything to everything. And, you know, pH of four to eight and a half and, you know, sugar sand all the way to heavy, heavy clay. So we get to experience a lot of crappy soils without having to farm them ourselves, which is kind of a great deal. Uh, so. You know, and, and to be honest, 
what we've seen is that you know cover crops can give you the most benefits in some of those really tough soils because they're the ones that need the most help. And uh, you know, but in order to do that, you may have to change what you're doing. You may, you know, we've got some customers that we're working with uh, up in central Nebraska, real sandy area, and they've got a big feed lot, and they're just they were doing silage corn after silage corn after silage corn. And they saw that yield just go down year after year after year. Well, you know, they are crappy soils to begin with. And then they're doing one of the most highly extractive, most compacting processes possible. They can silage year after year. They were just beating it to a pulp. So they've taken those, you know, they took three or four pivots at a time out of corn silage production. And, and we just planted it to, to two rounds of cover crops a year, a spring one and then a summer one. And they got plenty of water and they got manure. So they can pour that onto it. And then they just grazed that. They, they have plenty of uh, cow-calf operation. They came in and they grazed those pivots, rotationally grazed through them. Uh, and they did that for two years, and then they came back to corn, and they said it just had a huge increase in their corn yields, as well as that additional grazing took a lot of pressure off their native grass pastures as well. So cover crops can work in about any soil type, and in the, in the tough soils, sometimes you'll see the biggest benefits. So. Thank you. I am planning on still being around this afternoon for the Q&A. So if you come up with other questions, put them in the question box. Let's okay, have a round of applause for people. All right, like keep doing my job for me. There are the question boxes. So if you think of something later, we're gonna 